And Galen Wagner is professor of medicine, and uh, he is indeed an expert in the field of ECG, and he is one of the leading researchers in this field in the world. And uh, for at least 10 years, I think, you have been the editor in chief for the Journal of Electrocardiology. And uh, Professor Wagner has written several textbooks about electrocardiology and also about uh, multimodal cardiovascular imaging. And uh, also, Professor Wagner has uh, contributed significantly to various collaborations all over the world, to national ones and international ones, uh, in, in, mostly in the field of, 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 of ECG. Um, and uh, for example, I, I heard that since the 1990, around there, you have had collaboration, and you, since then you have an ongoing collaboration with with the, the faculties of medicine and also engineering at Lund University. And I think it was a couple of years ago that you became an honorary doctor at Lund University as well. Yes. That's correct, yeah. So it feels very special for us uh, to have the honor to have you here today. And uh, I heard that this lecture will be a little bit unconventional. <laughs> And I'm very uh, curious to see it, to see it, to follow it. Uh, and uh, yes, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Kalio, for that introduction. Uh, my name is Bjorn Weislander, uh, and this uh, Gail's talk will be in the format of a dialogue between us two uh, about the 50 years of clinical physiology research and mentoring that you've been through. And to start things off, uh, one phrase that I very often hear uh, come out of your mouth uh, when we talk about this is this, the university without walls. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Coming from a university, Duke University, that's a typical university with its own walls, I made the decision early on that I wanted to do clinical medicine, but I also wanted to do research. And as I did research, I learned that the research I did within the walls of Duke had certain capabilities, certain, uh, had certain challenges, but there were other challenges that just I could not meet. There was nobody, even Duke, though Duke had some excellence, there was no one there I could collaborate with to move to the next level of where I wanted to be. So I learned that for me, I need to go beyond the walls of Duke University for the collaboration that I need, felt I needed for my research. So over time, I have more and more appreciated interaction with people outside Duke, both for doing the research and also for teaching and mentoring other people to do research. So you speak about walls. With the, uh, up around the University of Duke as an obstacle to achieving a increased uh, quality in, in research and solving certain problems. Or were there university, uh, walls within the university as well? What type of walls were those? Sure, because within the university, uh, I, I decided I was in medicine, so more and more we found there were some kind of problems our patients had which could be treated much better by surgery. So we had to figure out then how to bridge the wall between medicine and surgery. Also, I was using electrocardiography and biochemical markers for diagnosing people with myocardial infarction, because that was my job on the coronary care unit. But uh, sometimes we found that uh, we really needed to uh, have various kinds of imaging, and imaging was coming along, echocardiography, nuclear imaging, and so we had to bridge the wall between the electrocardiography that we were doing on the coronary care unit and places in the hospital that were doing cardiac catheterization, scintigraphy, echo, and so forth. So those walls had to be bridged to get the diagnostic information to best take care of the patients. That was my responsibility on this coronary care unit, which mainly had patients with myocardial infarction. So in helping people then with myocardial infarction, uh, could you talk to me a little bit about those uh, diagnostic methods that you used and the imaging methods uh, that, that were available at the time and that you used? And how you apply those. For instance, here on this slide, we have, have 
craft. So. Yes, sir. To, my first job was to try to make a diagnosis whether an infarction occurred or not. And for that, I could use the electrocardiogram because I had become quite used, uh, used to that. But also, we needed to get biochemical markers. And the only biochemical markers we had were very general, total this, total that. So I had to begin to work with a pediatric um, metabolism uh, individual who had developed an isoenzyme method. So even to diagnose infarction, I had to work with somebody in the Department of Pediatrics because then we were able to use electrocardiogram and biochemical markers to make the diagnosis of infarction. And then, uh, over time, we began to realize that not everyone with infarction should be treated the same way. Some got quite stable almost immediately. Others had various kinds of complications. And so we had a challenge of figuring out, well, how should we individualize care? And we had all the patients with infarction were there on our unit, but we knew we couldn't treat them all the same, or we should not treat them all the same. And initially they were treated much the same. Stay at bed rest for a long time, stay monitored for a long time. So we began to come up with the concept that depend, the thing that would determine how to best take care of the patient after the infarction was to estimate how large an infarction there was. Well, we had no method to do that. So how do we use the biochemical marker? How do we use the ECG to estimate how large the infarction was? And I was very fortunate because I heard of a person in California, Ronald Sylvester, who had a cardiac rehabilitation program and was using an electrocardiographic method for just taking a plain old electrocardiogram and doing a scoring system that he had developed from computer simulation to estimate how large the infarction was. So he came to Duke, and this slide shows on the, uh, on the uh, x-axis this QRS score that was a way of taking information on the standard electrocardiogram, giving weights to different criteria, and coming up with a score. And the score was to estimate that each point on the score, the score had many points, and each point estimated, was made to estimate 3% in the left ventricle infarcted. So we had to try to see how that related to other methods, and on the y-axis here is the left ventricular ejection fraction determined by myocardial scintigraphy. So we took a series of patients who had infarction, and just before they went home, we of course had the electrocardiogram, we did the Sylvester score on the electrocardiogram, we got scintigraphy, and this shows the relationship between the left ventricular ejection fraction and scintigraphy and the QRS score. And you can see, actually, there was a very, very good relationship between the two. And that was immediately after infarction. So, in other words, you, you were able to, to say something about their uh, ejection fraction just from looking at the electrocardiogram in the acute phase with the help of this Ron Celestri guy. Which was amazing to me because all we had done at Duke was use electrocardiogram for diagnosis. But by going outside the walls of Duke to this person in California, we now had the ability to use the electrocardiogram. Same old electrocardiogram, but now we could use it for a totally further purpose of estimating how large the damage was. So. Uh, moving on in the, in the interest of covering all these two years. Um, Let's keep that slide up just a minute, though, because I, ask me the next question. I think I can use something from that slide to help illustrate the next slide. What's, what's, what's your call? Okay. So, so what, what's the real significance of this relationship? Well, this, this relationship proved true immediately after the infarct. But as patients got out and back home and doing things, oftentimes they had further chest pain. And so now bypass surgery had been developed, and so we were sending patients to bypass surgery, but what we found was that when a patient had a very low ejection fraction, the surgeon would say, oh, I'm very concerned, I don't want to operate on that patient unless it's a desperate situation, because if we operate on something with a low ejection fraction, very complicated post-operative course. And so we said, well, maybe after an infarction, when patients have further chest pain, maybe there's no longer a good relationship between these two. In fact, we found patients who were down here in this lower left-hand area that we didn't see post-infarction. And we said, wow, what's going on? They have the same QRS score, but now a lower ejection fraction. So we developed the hypothesis that in those patients, in addition to whatever drop in ejection fraction from infarction, they had further drop in the ejection fraction because of ischemia. So we thought that maybe in those patients where there was a poor relationship between ejection fracture and QRS, that means those patients would be more likely to benefit from bypass surgery. So we did an experiment to look at that. And where are they? Well, the next slide is, is, uh, is, is really shows that because you can see 
on the left, uh, uh, and, and on, on the y-axis is the difference between pre-op measured uh, ejection fraction by radionuclide and the ejection fraction estimated by the QRS score. So that would be drop in ejection fraction estimated by QRS score. So if a patient, if, if that fit, if they fit each other, that patient was said to have ischemic, a low ischemia index. On the other hand, there were some patients now who would be down that lower left-hand corner where you could not account for the low ejection fraction because of the QRS score. And we said, okay, we think those patients are ones that have new ischemia, and therefore they're more likely to benefit. And what this slide shows is, in fact, when we brought patients then back after bypass surgery at three months, indeed, we showed that those that have a high ischemia index were the ones that had most, 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 most benefit. And benefit is shown by improvement in ejection fraction between the pre-op measured ejection fraction and the post-op measured ejection fraction. So the concept of ischemia could also. So you, you were able to find ischemia uh, and differentiate that from infarction as a cause of as a cause of low function yes right and this was all done using the ECG and radionuclide determination of left ventricular ejection fraction right and using it within do but using but based on this Sylvester score that we had gotten from California for a gentleman a cardiologist an investigator from California right and so uh, you managed to break down the wall a little bit between uh, surgery and medicine there uh, by coupling to with, with this new therapeutic uh, intervention of coronary artery bypass graft, uh, you were able to help surgeons then tell who was really appropriate candidate for that. And so, uh, what was the next step in breaking down walls? For, what does this slide show, and how does this relate to breaking down walls? Well, by the I think this study was done around 2000, and. I talked about cardiac catheterization, but we never did cardiac catheterization in the acute phase. We were afraid to do it because we didn't have any understanding of the role of clot in causing myocardial infarction. So the only patients who were considered for, for catheterization and surgery were people who were past in the chronic phase. But in the 1980s, it had been demonstrated that the etiology of infarction most commonly was a clot. So the question comes then, okay, if a patient comes in with chest pain, maybe instead of going directly to coronary care unit, some of them could first go to the catheterization laboratory to have either drug given or mechanical means of, of opening up the artery. And so the concept came, well, if a patient meets certain criteria of ST segment elevation, they were a candidate for that. But we had come to see that there were some patients who had chest pain, looked just like my story, but they didn't have ST elevation. They didn't meet so-called STEMI criteria. And we found that many of them had just ST segment depression. And we didn't really understand what that meant. And uh, a, 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 a clinical physiologist from Sweden, Ula Palm, who's here today, did a sabbatical in, at Wake Forest University near to do in North Carolina in 1988. And when he began to look at electrocardiograms in America, and I began to look at electrocardiograms that he brought from Sweden. They looked very different because in America we used this, this display in which we had four sets of three leads. He was using two sets of six leads. And what I found was that if we concentrate on, uh, on this, this, this picture really is something that, that was evolved from the work that Ula and I did, in which we see both the frontal plane and the transverse plane with a depiction of the heart in the middle. But if we concentrate on the left, it's the frontal plane. And you can see over to the left, the leads. ABL, if, we, if we start with where lead one is just above his ABL, then minus ABR, two, F3. And from the Swedish electrocardiograms, they were shown in that sequence. We never saw that sequence at Duke, because at Duke, we used first lead one, two, and three, and lead ABR, ABL, and ABF. So we never thought of this in some orderly way. And we used, of course, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. But as Ola and I began to talk, it was apparent that 
One was using leave ADR, one was using minus ADR. Well, if every lead had a negative so-called antipode or um, uh, a negative lead, let's say, um, reciprocal, if ADR had it, every lead had it. So we began to realize we don't just have a 12 lead EKG or a 13 lead EKG, we really have a 24 lead ECG without putting any more electrodes on. And all we have to do is with the machine generate the opposite. So the opposite allows you then to have a total of 24 leads. And this particular electrocardiogram, if we concentrate on it, is a patient with acute chest pain who does not meet STEMI criteria. If you look at this electrocardiogram, you don't see ST elevation in any of the standard leads. In fact, the only leads where you see ST elevation are down here in the transverse plane at minus V4, minus V3, minus V2, and minus V1. So, so when was this? I mean, I mean this uh, paper was published uh, in 2002, but when, when did you first meet Owen? 1988. 1988. And so we interacted and we sort of evolved our thinking and it took a long time before we came to the understanding that we could come up with a totally different display. This is just a different display of 12 lead ECG. We, we're not taking a single additional lead, but we're showing both the positive and negative of each lead, and we're showing them in an, in, in an array of, of a clock face display. So it, it becomes a way where one can sort of envision right. the, so, so, uh, the relationship between what's going on in the heart and what's going on in the ECG. Right, so, so I mean, uh, as I noticed, these uh, previous references, I just happened to notice they were published in, in very prominent journals, such as New England Journal of Medicine and so forth. And so what you remind is the reason why, why Duke as a center was, was so pioneering in this uh, type of research, how to take care of uh, patients with myocardial infarction left early. Uh, so what, what was the reason why Duke <laughs> was, so, was so, so pioneering in taking care of myocardial infarction patients? So early, I mean, back in the 70s and so forth. Yeah, Duke was a relatively new university. Mm -hmm. And Duke was only found, Duke, Duke University had been there for many years, but the medical, Duke Medical School was only founded in 1930. So actually, when I got there as a medical student in 1961, was the first time we had any new faculty, because before that was just the faculty. So it was, being so young at the university, it was much more interested in doing innovative things, I think, in a, in a more established place. So, for example, here, I, when I, I first took responsibility for directing the coronary care unit, I was 26 years old. What a strange thing to take somebody that young and say, okay, we have a coronary care unit. It's only been around for two years, but because of my interest, I could actually have a role which I otherwise, at a more established, you know, I never could have had. So it was a place where there was more likely that he would take chances and give responsibilities to young people. So, so very, everything was very new then in terms of coronary care. Uh, how did you manage to, uh, what was your strategy to improve care with so little knowledge uh, being available in the field? We at Duke had the, the people who began, the person who began the coronary care unit just before uh, I got there had it was early in the days of coronary care, and the National Institute of Health had come up with a request for uh, applications for myocardial infarction research unit. And Duke applied and got one of the five in the United States. But, but the rule that was made was a strange rule, and that was that you could only possibly get a myocardial infarction research unit if you agreed to do something with a computer. And computers were new then. This was in 1960. 1960s. Well, well, yeah, and, and so I started on the coronary care unit in, in, in 67. But we knew the computer was coming, and so the job I had was to, was to come up with, and, and computers couldn't hold very much information. So they said, okay, you can, you, you can only put 100 pieces of information on any patient. So my job was to figure out which 100 pieces of information I thought was most important. So some from the past history, some from the acute, some from the chronic, and then we did follow up. So, my job, as I saw patients from day to day on the coronary care unit, was make sure it entered the patients into a computerized data bank, with the idea that that bank then would be a repository which could be an investment. So in the future, as we got 300, 400, 1,000 patients, we now had a wide array, variety of patients from before, and we could try to match our new patient problem up to other patients with the same problem in the past. And that was a great benefit for me in doing research and teaching and then being able to move forward in my career. 
So you had a computer, you were able to store about 100 pieces of information per patient, which is then approximately one uh, Twitter tweet. <laughs> That's an interesting perspective. And the, 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 the computer, I mean, to hold even that much information, it had to be built in an area that was about, I'd say, 20 feet by 20. It had to be elevated. There was a false floor because underneath was a fan to keep the thing from blowing up. It was amazing when you think about the kind of computer that existed in 1968. But it was quite adequate to do what I needed to do for keeping track of key information from every patient. <coughs> so, so skipping forward in time then, uh, you met Ola, uh, this, uh, who first had a sabbatical in at Duke, and how then did you how then did the collaboration with uh, people outside uh, of you progress? Well, we began, because we had done so much innovative uh, work at Duke, and let's look at, at, at the next slide, we had people coming from various places in, in, in the world to, so to what, work with us. What, what does this show? Well, this looks at the other end of the ST segment elevation criteria, because just as I showed before, there were some patients who did not make standing criteria, but in fact they were having thrombotically caused acute infarct. We also had other conditions. This is an example of a patient with left bundle branch block, who just in the course of left bundle branch block routinely had ST segment elevation here in V2, V3 that would have met standing criteria. So if that patient had chest pain and came to the emergency room, they would all be taken to the cardiac catheterization lab to look for the clot. They didn't have any clot. They had chronic left bundle branch block, pain for some reason, met STEMI criteria, and so you'd be doing a very disservice, great disservice to the patient if you said, oh, they meet STEMI criteria, they must be having an infarct, let's treat them that way. So we realized that we were in a, we were in a bind. We needed to develop new, in this case, not, ST, not, not, not just STEMI equivalent criteria, but new criteria for ST elevation and left bundle branch block and we had an investigator who came to Duke from Buenos Aires, Argentina, Elena Scarbosa, and she was interested in tackling this problem. And so the concept was, let's look at new criteria, more strict criteria on the ECG for ST segment change, which might be beyond that scene in just plain old left bundle branch block. And so she came up with this scoring system that you see uh, which uh, in which you get points for various different specific uh, changes on the ECG on beyond STEMI. And then by looking at this ROC curve, you can see that as those points were added, you actually got high specificity. So whereas specificity for STEMI criteria would be very, very low, specificity for these special criteria were in fact high, and so we were able then to have highly specific criteria for ST segment change in the presence of left bundle branch block. So this was obviously also a big deal, uh, as it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine also. Uh, and so, uh, were there other challenges in the front of the block that, uh, apart from just the, the problem of diagnosing my heart infarction? Not at that time, but later on, the, there was the clinical realization that there were patients who had heart failure, where the cause was the specific cause of poor synchrony between the walls of the left ventricle. How does that work? Well, normally you have a left ventricle activated in such a way so that you have contraction like so, and if the entire left ventricle has problems, disease of some sort, it may contract poorly, but still there's synchrony of contraction. And how does that relate to the image you see here on this slide? Well, what we see here, if we look at the right side, we see isochromes that are made as a map of activation of the heart. And with the, the deeper red being early, you can see how with the intact left bundle, and we look at the EKG, shows no evidence of bundle branch block. In that situation, you see the way the isochrome spread from endocardium to epicardium in the left ventricle, and pretty much the same time spreading through the septal area, the inferior area, and the anterior area, and only later, through the lateral wall, but not much later. On the other hand, in the bottom example, where we now have a patient with left bundle branch block, very, very different activation, because since the electricity can't get down the left bundle, it gets down to the right bundle, and the only way it gets it through the septum is from right to left. 
That means the septum's activated early, but only later than the inferior and anterior wall, and much later than the lateral wall. So the left ventricle is activated, normally it's activated kind of in, in, in parallel. The wall's in parallel. Here the walls are activated in series, but only if you really have left bundle branch block. And so that was, uh, and, and we know, and, and this again, we went back to Ron Sylvester and said, we need better criteria for left bundle branch block because we better be very sure the patient has a left bundle branch block. Because otherwise, they might just have poor contract, poor, act, poor activation of the myocardium. And Ron Sylvester pointed out the thing to look for to really diagnose left bundle branch block and distinguish it from non specific interventricular conduction delay was a mid QRS slowing shown by a slur or a notch. And you can see the reason would be the first 40 milliseconds of, the EK, uh, of time, you just have activation of the septum, and you're going to have a pretty smooth waveform. But once the electricity gets through the septum, you now have activation of two very different areas far apart, the inferior and the anterior walls, and that's going to tend to cause some interruption. And that should be shown in the ECG as a mid-QRS area of slowing. So, Ron Sylvester said, look for slurs or not in the middle of the QRS. If they're not there, that wide QRS is probably caused by something that's just poor conduction through the myocardium. So if you'll notice then, as we blow up from lead one, ADL, et cetera, in the presence of left bundle branch block, you see the mid-QRS slowing or notching in one and ADL. And so that became then uh, a, a, a marker, and uh, David Strauss, who was a young investigator working with me, worked with Ron Sylvester, and came up with these new criteria for defining that bundle branch block. Who's, who's David Strauss? David was a Duke medical student who, uh, who knew he wanted to do research, and at Duke, it's possible to take one whole year and do research. And most people would stay at Duke and stay in some lab at Duke. But uh, since I was working with Olaf Hall and others at Lund, uh, there was a meeting uh, in, in, in Lund, and David came along with me, made a presentation. We got to know the various people at Lund and see what they were doing, particularly in magnetic resonance imaging. So Martin Jurgander and others uh, in the group were young people at that time who were getting their own research in magnetic resonance imaging. David got to know them. They liked him, he liked them. And he was actually invited then to take one extra year in medical school and, 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 and come, to, come to Lund and be able then to do further studies, but now with myocardial uh, imaging and then qualify for a PhD. So in the process, David was doing this kind of work, came to Lund, worked there, and did then, in just one extra year of medical school, have his PhD. So he graduated MD from Duke, PhD from Lund. So this was an example of somebody who left the Duke walls, came here, and got something he never could have gotten at Duke that changed his career dramatically. So the young researcher, uh, Dave Strauss, in this case, an American, uh, went over to Lund, and as a result, you got to know a whole bunch of people there also, but you already know some. Uh, so would it have happened that Dave got over to uh, Lund without you having previous uh, uh, connections there in the form of uh, Olaf Palm? Oh, we'd have to ask Olaf Palm. Uh, I mean, comment in the question period, but I don't believe so because I think that um, there had to be a period of interaction and mutual benefit and therefore trust develop. And I had had individuals from Lund uh, who had come uh, to, to do. You know, Kirsten, for example, who's here now, had, had, had done so, and she was getting her PhD in work she did in Lund, but she interacted at uh, at Duke. And so we had experience with people from Lund coming to Durham, and here was an opportunity for somebody from Durham coming to Duke. So I think that background of that kind of interaction really facilitated David being able to move in, the, in this direction and had a remarkable outcome of getting a PhD at Lund <coughs> in, that, uh, in that period of time. So, so this paper is pretty recent. Uh, I see the reference here from 2011, and we've just sort of seen a uh, bunch of glimpses from these uh, past, you know, last 50 years of research that you've been a part of. Uh, but so, um, moving on a little bit to, what's, what's your focus nowadays going back to this University of Rock Falls? 
I, over time, and some people at lunch were asking, and we talked about this, but over time, I began to realize that my goal were to help young people who were in the midst of their undergraduate medical education, but who were somewhat dissatisfied with only the kind of education, and I say only, obviously comprehensive education in medical school, but they felt something was missing. They felt that in addition to that, they were quite adventurous, and they'd like to take some time out to see what they could do as their own project. So as that happened, then I began to work with others to figure out, well, how could, how could this be developed more into a program? And so I worked with Ola, I worked with Mark Ugander at, uh, at Paralinska, uh, and some others in the concept that we began to call, in fact, this was Martin's idea to use the name Kromship. And Kromship was, there were ships that were at old times uh, in, the, in the harbors of the Netherlands were used to outfit and to supp as supply for warships. And so a Kromship was a small ship of that kind, but also the CROM, could be used as an acronym for Clinical Research Odyssey Mentoring. So clinical research, that's what we wanted to accomplish, helping people to learn clinical research. But Odyssey, where they had to leave the comforts of their own place and go somewhere else. So David Strauss had to leave the comforts of Durham and come to Lund. Somebody else had to and vice versa. So, so Odyssey became a part of it. And that's why the name Clinical Research Odyssey Mentoring. And so what's happened is that over time, I, in collaboration with individuals like Lula, Martin, and others, have been developing this concept of trying to recruit young people to go on their odyssey. And the key thing is that these people are expected to identify a project they're interested in, work with mentors in their own place and elsewhere, not just do, and actually complete the project completed the point of submitting and publishing that manuscript with himself as first author. So it's very high expectation. That seems like an ambitious goal. Oh, it is an ambitious goal, and the individual who wants to do it has to be, well, you've got to do this yourself. And so you had such an ambitious goal, and uh, what did you find when, turn around the questions, what did you <laughs> find when, uh, when you actually took such an odyssey? It must have been, what? What did you feel? How did this feel to you? Uh, well, it certainly was uh, uh, challenging and, and discomfortable at times to, to get to this uh, other university with multiple mentors involved and with the expectation of completing a research project and me not having uh, uh, any idea how to do research, really. Uh, but so, I mean, there were tough uh, times, but going through it, uh, I certainly became a much better researcher and perhaps also uh, better than if I would have just stayed at the Karolinska, or maybe uh, more independently. Uh, did, did you know when you made the journey, did you know that you'd be expected to finish and publish your work? Yeah, that was part of the deal. That so that wasn't any mystery? No, no, <laughs> there wasn't any, I, I didn't get tricked. <laughs> uh, but, and so, I mean, me being one example, and Dave, uh, but so, uh, or, or there, has this happened like two or three times, or what's the, what's the, is there a track record for this sort of methodology, or how many patients, how, how many, how many oh, patients, uh, <laughs> uh, students have done this? Um, I would think over the years, something in the range of 50, 60, 70, some number of individuals, I know that Martin and I have been working together to try to actually document this, do a study of those who have gone through the program, get outcome information, not only what they've accomplished, but what they think about the program. So we're, we're right now beginning to say it's time, we think, to try to document what difference this has made in a variety of outcome ways. So there have been a lot of people and from a lot of different places in the world who have done essentially this kind of program, and the goal is always the same, for the young investigator to complete the project. And oftentimes that means you have to get the design down, down, down to the point where it's doable, given the resources you've got, for X number of months, X amount of money, in fact, very little money, but mainly interest and hard work. So how many uh, have really completed this goal of publishing a manuscript as a first author uh, as a medical student? 
just I'll, I'll let these pick your signature stuff. Once we've completed our study, we'll know the exact answer, but I would say almost all of them. Almost all of them. Almost all, all of them. And with themselves as the first author. So a pretty good track record. But how, I mean, this requires a certain commitment from the students also who have to put in um, a lot, lots of uh, energy and, and, and time. And also, it's a little bit of a leap, leap of faith. Do you have any stru a structured way of recruiting these subjects? Or uh, well, students. The, 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 um, the recruitment must be done by the person who's the mentor at the local place. I have to recruit Dave Strauss. Hmm. Martin has to recruit you. So somebody locally has to recruit the individual and then decide whether they believe the individual could actually accomplish this. And then agree that during the process, there's going to be three stages. The first stage is at the local place, the two mentors working with the student to develop a design, get the design to a point where it can potentially go before an institutional review board so that only come to the away place once that design is, is, is complete. Then at the away place, which is the second phase, collect the data, analyze the data, begin to write the manuscript drafts, and get, get the manuscript in final form as judged by the mentors and the other co-investigators as ready for submission and actually submit the manuscript to some journals before leaving to go back home. And then the third phase is once they're back home, deal with reviews and perhaps rejection from the first journal, but now they're more committed to actually accomplishing uh, publication because they've invested so much and it's their study, they're the first author. And that third phase after they get back home is a very important phase in the process. So, so it seems like there's multiple phases to this. And this first phase, of deciding the project, uh, how does it that relate to this slide? Uh, IRIT, uh, International Research Interdisciplinary School. What what's that? Well, this has really evolved because we found that that a key aspect is getting more universities around the world interested in participating in this so-called University Without Walls program. So what we expect from these universities is they find some student, and instead of investing in sending them off someplace like Duke or wherever, they just invest in, in having them participate in a four-day workshop in which they go through the practice of design. So we developed these so-called IRIS programs in the following way. Um, a host country says, we'd like to sponsor a program. We then those of us who are working with the program say, okay, the limit is 20 people, but you can have 10 come from your country, but you have to be willing to have 10 come from other countries. And then there'll be a four day period in which they then break up into groups of five people, and each group of five people will design one project. And they then take that through four workshops of design. And the very last workshop, after they've got a design, they then get off in their group and they develop a PowerPoint presentation of the design of their project. And the very last thing that happens is they actually present that design for, the own, for, 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 for their peers. And then of course that's over and they're back at their own place. And so now we have done I think 15 or 16 such programs. And this just shows that we have three programs that actually have occurred in 2015. And the leader of this is really Luba Bakarova. Luba Bakarova is a physician uh, investigator in Bratislava of uh, the Slovak Republic, and she's the person who saw this process, be, as we did, uh, the process of design at Duke, and decided this was something that she wanted to develop then in her part of Europe and some other places. As you can see now, uh, by 2015, uh, this occurred, and this year there have been uh, programs in three different continents, and, uh, and uh, so the question was finding some name, and so the name that was developed was Iris. And Iris because Iris represents the colored part of the eye, Iris a beautiful flower, but also Luke and I found out that Iris was the name of the Greek goddess of the rainbow. And then we found out that a rainbow really isn't just a bow. Maybe that's all we see, but in fact a rainbow is a rain circle, typically usually seen from the air, but in this particular example, seen from somebody at the seaside. So we used that name Iris then and 
as the logo for these programs. But it's, it's a way of finding students, getting them involved in design, and hopefully some of them then will decide to do their own projects. So once a student has been through one of these projects that are in all you know, these diverse places in the world, and then gone through this Cronship mentoring experience with this Odyssey, and then published their first uh, paper, is there also a for, um, forum that you imagine that would be appropriate for them to present these results, for instance? It has to be developed. The forum has to be developed because, because what you want them to do, once they've actually done a project and they publish their project, to have a time to present their work at some small meeting. And something like a huge meeting, then it's kind of intimidating, plus also they may, uh, not, uh, they may be sort of lost in the crowd. So we've developed small meetings, and one, uh, one that we call MALT, because you give some kind of funny name, and uh, MALT was called MALT because we started the first MALT was actually in, Scot in Scotland. And so MALT in Scotland was kind of a thing. And so then we had to come up with a name. So we sort of concocted a name, the Imaging and Electrical Technologies Meeting. Well, obviously we, we, wanted, we wanted to use MALT, so we had to come up with some name somehow. Right. In some way, right? but, but, the, but the meeting then is something, and what we do now is once a year, we have a meeting someplace. There's always somebody who plans the meeting, finds the place for it. In fact, uh, in fact Martin uh, has taken on the responsibility of developing the MALT program for 2016. So we talk about that, and he's thinking about where to have it, what might be the, the, the various formats, and we've been talking about that. But we have we have a second type of meeting called the staff meeting, which is a different kind of subject but the same kind of form. But the purpose of these is so the young, just as you suggested, the young investigator who's now done a project has an opportunity to present their project, sometimes just in planned form, sometimes in finished form, with their peers. So the meetings then, small group, 20, 25, 30 people around the table, young person presents, 15 minutes, 15 minutes for discussion, and they get feedback, and so they begin to learn to work with other people around the world who are in the same, who've done a similar thing they've done. So there's a community then that's developed in this. And with that, uh, I think it's time for to open up for questions. So thank you, Gail Wagner. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> because I, I really appreciate what you've done, Jordan, because I think that uh, as I've talked to some people at lunch, I am not very interested in or very good at giving formal presentations. <laughs> so I'd much rather have an interactive discussion. So I appreciate the way you've handled this and the way that we've been able to connect because we connected in other ways and have connected in other ways. And this is really the first time that we've done this kind of interaction. So I appreciate you doing that. Well, thank you. The only taking time off from his usual job as, as the uh, as the interviewer with what's the station uh, to, uh, CBBD in Copenhagen? No, in Stockholm. In Stockholm. Yeah, so he's taking time off from his usual profession to to do this. So. Uh. Yeah. Thank you very much, both Galen and, and Bjorn. Sorry, I didn't introduce you, but <laughs> you did a very good job. <laughs> so. Um, I think, I think actually history has been written today uh, in terms of having this uh, Trojan first time uh, lecture in this e format, and I think it was very, very good. I really liked it. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Uh, and I You're think probably a little bit worried, but... <laughs> uh, no, no, no. 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 <laughs> and I think it's also very appropriate to talk about this university without walls, uh, since we are here in another room. It's a kind of, of, of young university, and I, I guess that the walls are not so high between departments here. Correct me if I, I'm wrong, but <laughs> I think so. So, yeah, it was very good. Uh, now we have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, thoughts, comments to Galen and Björn. I like Please. to be, 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 as we start, I, I, I like to put Ava on the spot a bit because Ava, you participated in this program, I don't know how many years ago, but we talked about the age of your children and they've certainly gotten a bit older since the time. That, but what, 
what, what do you have? What, what is your thought about this? Because you participated very fully and completely as you did your own research and uh, then as you have watched this and participated through your career. But what have your thoughts been about this program? I really appreciate having you as a co-supervisor for my PhD project. And uh, I went to you in Durham for two weeks. And it was in the beginning of my research period. And uh, you taught me a lot. And I get to meet all the other, several other uh, students that were uh, in the same phase as me, and we had projects together with Denmark, Copenhagen students. And uh, it was nice to do the staff meetings that you mentioned, to meet the uh, researchers um, from other countries. And uh, it was, it was uh, very stimulating. You all were raised, you were very full of uh, ideas. And uh, I would have to thank you. <laughs> you well, really thank you. You really gave me the opportunity to thank you. No, I, I'm glad. It's so good to see you here today, and so glad that you, you had the opportunity to say what was on your mind about this because all during this time, I was never your primary mentor. Your primary mentor was a little back in, uh, in, in your home institution. And you said that it was only, I hadn't remembered how long you were in Durham, but you said it was just two weeks, but somehow those two weeks, something happened, and then we stayed connected. Yes. We didn't, did. we didn't stop our connection when, after those two weeks. And I remembered walks on the shore at Bostad and, uh, and various interactions uh, over time. Yes. Uh, yes. So it was a relationship which didn't require a long time away, but enough time to be away get away from your own comfort situation so that we can then form a relationship which was whatever it needed to be for you over that period of time. And I appreciate it too. I mean, I, I also got a lot from the relationship and have enjoyed the relationship over time that I've had with you. Yeah, yes, you said two weeks for uh, what I can manage. <laughs> <laughs> two young children? I yes. Mean. And you came to Sweden several times. So we, we had a lot of time to connect. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and I also thank Ulla, of course, <laughs> for the opportunity. I think Ma Martin would like to say something here. Uh, no, I, I have a question. Uh, so this philosophy of uh, clinical research training that you talked about today, uh, I. I, uh, I've experienced it with you, and I've understood it. But would you say that this is the typical that, that this is shared by the administrators at the departments of uh, the faculties of medicine, or is there a challenge there in the walls between uh, your philosophy and that of the universities? Yeah, it's quite a challenge, and the reason is that within the university. Um, there's a conflict of interest. We talked about conflicts of interest between industry and university, or conflicts of interest between this and that. But one would not think that within a particular academic university, there would be a conflict of interest with young people who are learning how to be doctors, to also learn how to be clinical investigators, to have a career in which they both doctor and do clinical research. But there is such a and the reason there's such a conflict is that, is that the academic university, medical university has really two primary purposes. One is to produce academicians who are not doing clinical things, although their research would lead to things that would do so. At Duke University, Bob Lefkowitz recently got a Nobel Prize. His whole life has been in the laboratory, developing aspects of the beta receptor, very important. But Bob never did clinical research, meaning that Bob made the decision early on. He wanted to do basic research, not take care of patients at all. I made a very different decision. 
But Bob and I have had very different kinds of success as far as functioning at Duke University. Because for me, Bob didn't have to go outside Duke University. There were many students who over the years would come to Bob's lab. But for me, it wasn't going to happen. Because the people who really were trained to be physicians and who wanted to be physicians in their career and wanted to mainly function as physicians, then were very poorly able to have enough time to do research. I was actually specifically thinking about the ambitions of a project uh, from the medical school perspective as opposed to your perspective on what the student's role should be. Should it be to participate or to publish? And if there's a, if you see any, the, I was thinking about the conflicts there. Well, it's true because in the medical school, they're, inter they're interested in teaching the student information. And the idea of most people in a medical school is a, an individual to do a research project, particularly as the, pro, as the first invest, has to have a lot of information. And the, the belief is they don't have enough information as a student. Maybe as a student they can help out on some project. But the idea that a medical student really had the ability to, to take the lead role, do the majority of the design with the input, publish the manuscript for themselves as opposed to first author. I mean, it just, it just doesn't even seem possible. And most people, in, I'm not just do, but I've talked, it just, it just seems like it's an impossibility. So they don't have that expectation within that medical school. So it does become a conflict and something where it's only going to happen if I, as a faculty person, am very determined and get input from people not only in my own school, but outside. Interestingly, now, there's much more buy-in and do for this process than there was. But one main reason is they've been able to see what's happened by the interaction I've had outside of do. Yeah. So what, what's your, uh, with, with these uh, 50 years of experience and, and many years of uh, Mentoring, what, what, what are your top do's and don'ts for people looking to mentor students for the first time in doing research? The first thing would be to understand what mentoring is and what mentoring isn't. And all of our, our new students, since they have a year of research, they're all, they, they say, oh, I found a mentor. But typically their definition of a mentor is somebody on the faculty who's quite interested in having them work with them but working with them on a project that the mentor wants to do that is going to further the mentor's career and the student's going to have some role that's a helping role. Oftentimes, the project's already started and the student now gets involved. Or the student's involved in starting the project, but there's a three-year project. The student's only going to be there for a short time. So if, if you're going to mentor and really mentor, then the, the fo focus has to be on the individual what do they want to do, and what's the length of time, what's the resources that they have. That's really mentor. The other is teaching, involvement, and so forth. But, but to me, mentoring, at, in, in, its, in its definition, is focusing on the individual, helping that individual to finish something of their, their, themselves. So focusing on the needs and, and situation of the students rather than the needs and situation of the mentor. That's right, and, and the realities of the student. So if even, even that has a family and she can only be in Durham for a short time, so that's okay. I'm not gonna say, gee, I can't work with you because she can't be there for a year or four months or something. Okay, you, you work with what you got. And then if the person really wants to do the research and has the support back home to do it, it can be accomplished. But only if you tr constrain it to what is the reality for that individual. accomplished quite a lot together, or you have accomplished quite a lot in our co cooperation. And not only with me, but also with Håkan Arhild and him in uh, Lund at the later, later stage. Martin and Henrik Engblom and uh, Marcus Carlson, who are all rather well known here, they were recruited while they were medical students, not when they had already, already graduated. 
and um, with, with a Hawkeye's mentorship, of course, during a long time, but being introduced to this design or project method, um, as far as I can see, done fairly well. Look at, look at Martin. <laughs> um, well, it's so been a great joy, and I think that uh, Ola, as usual, is, is understated about his own role, but as Eva has said, it's been, I, I couldn't have done any of this, really, without the partnership with Ola. And back and forth, and my gosh, I, I can't even imagine the number of times that we've been together and done various things in different places, Durham and here and elsewhere, uh, the number of times we talk or Skype, I mean, it's really been a great honor and pleasure for me to be in partnership with Ula during all this experience. And I can't in any way say, well, gee, I did this and Ula did that, because we, we plot and plan and scheme and do whatever, both with exactly the same purpose. Question? Uh, it's so interesting to hear, and um, um, I was just wondering what you feel when you are sitting here now. What are the things you are most proud of that you accomplished, and what did you not do until now and want to do? Well, I like to focus on the, on the last part of your question because what I really want to do, what I really want to do with this is I want to somehow have helped to make some progress toward changing the answer to the question that I gave to Martin because I want to make it so that it is much more in concert with the function of the academic medical school to do this. Not that what we're doing is in any way against the purpose of the academic medical school. Why should it be so difficult? Well, it is, and I'm not angry about the difference, but I feel like we've only begun to scratch the surface of it, and if this program is going to be successful in the future, it's going to need to be embraced by, whether it's Duke, Karolinska or literally whatever, as a part of it. Now the medical schools have embraced the concept of having the student have time for research. But the great majority of the students who are doing research are not having the goal of having their own project, getting it finished, and publishing it. So if that could be if that could be included as the purpose of the medical schools, and what does it mean downstream? Sure, the medical school needs to produce some people like Bob Lefkowitz and others who are excellent basic investigators. But also, the medical school, medical center, to be optimally successful, must produce individuals who are both doing their clinical work and doing clinical research as much as they possibly can for as much of the career as they can do it. So somehow, to have that become more their goal, not mine, I mean, what does it matter if you have X number of people who just sort of have this goofball goal that doesn't fit? So that's why I, I focus on the answer to the second part of your question, which is what I feel that I hope might happen. But I realize that there's so many reasons why not, because there's so many other goals that the Academic Medical Center must do. They don't have to do this. This is sort of a they might do it, but they don't have to do this. There's so many other things they have to do to survive and thrive. So this is kind of like, when you say, I see my cake or something. It's certainly not the case. But you nearly answered my first question, too, because it sounds that this is what you are proud of, that you accomplished these, all those students, and uh, we've heard the, what you've said, all of you up here, that you really accomplished Yes, and, I, and I'm, also, I'm also proud of the way I feel about it. I mean, I feel, I feel, I feel very, I think you can understand, I feel very good about this because it's been a very central aspect of my life. So. Thank you. Okay, I think we have to take a break soon, but uh, before that, I think we should give a big hand, another big hand to, to Gail and Magner. Thank you very much for an excellent lecture.
Thank you. And uh, as a token of, of our appreciation, we would like to give you a, a diploma here. <laughs> okay, thank you. If my wife were here to enjoy this. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.